Good morning. Welcome to worship on the sixth Sunday after Pentecost. The gospel today is the familiar gospel of Mary and Martha. And uh, we, we all kind of think we divide people up into Marys or Marthas, doers or listeners. However, Jesus does not favor one over the other, but he does call us to be in the position of, of listening so that we can be equipped to go out into the world and love the world as Jesus loves us. That's, I guess I gave you the sermon already, but uh, uh, that's what happens when I don't follow the script. But anyways, let us begin with the confession and forgiveness. I would invite you to please rise. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose steadfast love endures forever. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not followed your path, but have chosen our own way. Instead of putting others before ourselves, we long to take the best seats at the table When met by those in need, we have too often passed by on the other side. Set us again on the path of life. Save us from ourselves and free us to love our neighbors. Amen. Hear the good news. God does not deal with us according to our sins, but delights in granting pardon and mercy. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven You are free to love as God loves. Amen. Grace that is Christ's gift to us, the love of God, and the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace be with you all.
with you? Let us pray. Eternal God, you draw near to us in Christ, and you make yourself our guest. Amid the cares of our lives, make us attentive to your presence, that we may treasure your word above all else, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Lord, bless the reading of your word. Make it come alive in our midst. Amen. The first reading is from Genesis, the 18th chapter. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Marma as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, My Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread that you may refresh yourselves, and after that you may pass on, since you have come to your servant. So they said, Do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah and said, Make ready quickly three measures of choice flour, knead it, and make cakes. Ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the servant who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, Where is your wife, Sarah? And he said, There, in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season, and your wife, Sarah, shall have a son. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Let us read responsibly Psalm 15. Lord, who may dwell in your tabernacle? Who may abide upon your holy hill? Those who lead a blameless life and do what is right, who speak the truth from their heart. They do not slander with the tongue. They do no evil to their friends. They do not cast discredit upon a neighbor. In their sight, the wicked are rejected, but they honor those who fear the Lord. They have sworn upon their health and do not take back their word. They do not give their money in hope of gain, nor do they take bribes against the innocent. Those who do these things shall never be overthrown. Gospel according to Luke, the 10th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now as Jesus and his disciples went on their way, he entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks, so she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. This is the gospel of the Lord. 
Praise to you, O Christ. And please be seated. Lord, do you not care that my sister is not helping? Tell her then to help me. Friends, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and our Lord and our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. It was the Danish theologian Soren Kierkegaard who once said, Life is understood backwards, but it is lived forwards. The Jewish theologian Shmuley Yanklowitz says essentially the same thing. We cannot know the God of the future without knowing the God of our ancestors. In Jewish tradition, there is no moving forward without looking backwards. Martha, this morning, I don't think is distracted by her busyness as much as she's distracted by her ego. Her ego traps her, unable to understand her past, which prevents her from moving into her future. This morning I want to share a a short story uh, from my first colleague in ministry, Pastor Ed Yost, up at Redeemer Lutheran Church in Sakasana. He taught me the lesson, the very important lesson, when we look at pastoral ministry of the importance of understanding our past so that we can live into our future. Pastor Yost's first call was as a mission developer to Falls Church, Virginia. A mission developer, if you do not know, is a pastor who starts a church from scratch. It was the 1960s. And Falls Church, a suburb of Washington, D.C., was just beginning to boom. And the church deemed it important to have a Lutheran church amidst all of this growth. And it was highly unusual for a student or a seminary graduate to have that be the first call. Because it takes special gifts to start a church from scratch. But Pastor Yost did not disappoint. He had the gifts, and Holy Trinity Lutheran Church grew right along with Falls Church. The church loved Pastor Yost, and Pastor Yost loved the church, but after 10 years, Pastor Yost made the decision that he had to leave. And I'll never forget asking him, Ed, why did, why did you ever leave? <laughs> it, was, it was the perfect call. The church was self-sustaining. They had built a building. Again, as I said, the church was growing and all of the program was growing. But Pastor Yost told me, I knew it was time to leave when people started calling it Ed Yost Church <laughs> and not Holy Trinity Lutheran. Looking back, Ed Yost understood that the church is not about the pastor. The church obviously is about Jesus. But when one personality, and usually that is the pastor, when that becomes the when a church becomes too tied up in that one personality, the life of the congregation becomes more about success then it becomes about mission. And so to live forward, Pastor Yost moved on. Which brings me to the story of Mary and Martha. I always loved this story. I think it captures most people. We either are listeners (laughs) or we are doers. We either are Martha's or we are Mary's. But I was surprised this week as I was preparing for the sermon how this is one of, uh, this this is a troubling text for many pastors. And it is troubling because they don't like how Martha is treated. 
Martha is more than just a doer. Martha is a strong, independent, prosperous woman. Not typical in Palestinian society in these days. And notice also that Martha owned her own home. How many women owned their home back in Jesus' day? And then take a look at Martha. She is the one who extends hospitality. We are in chapters 9 and 10 of Luke's Gospel, the travel narrative, and we have heard many instances where people have not welcomed Jesus into their home. But Martha does. And the minute that she asks for a little help from her sister, Jesus chastises Martha. Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. It seems a little unfair. Or worse, it seems that Jesus is pitting the sisters against each other. Look at Mary. She has chosen the better part. But maybe it's not Jesus that these pastors have trouble with. Maybe it's the traditional interpretation of the text, a misinterpretation of the text. Because notice that Jesus is not rebuking Martha for her hard work. He's not rebuking Martha's independence or her prosperity. He is rebuking her stance her stance before Jesus, which, as we see, is a stance above Jesus. Because she is the one telling Jesus what to do. Tell her to help me. Not unlike Peter, right? In Matthew's Gospel, remember that? When Jesus has the, the, or shares the first passion prediction, he's going to go to Jerusalem and he's going to be crucified. And what does Peter do? He assumes authority over Jesus, takes him off to the side, you know, like a boss taking their employee off to the side to have a word or two. And he says, Lord, forbid it. This must never happen to you. And, of course, Jesus comes back with that very harsh response. Get behind me, Satan. You are setting your mind on human things and not divine things. Things. Thankfully, Jesus doesn't call Martha Satan. <laughs> okay, then we would have some, some problems here. But Jesus is very in tune to Martha's ego. Because notice in verse 40, it's all about me. Ma- but Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to the, Jesus and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself. Tell her to help me. Jesus is not favoring Mary over Martha, and neither is Jesus blowing off the hard work of hospitality. We all know if we entertain people in our home, that is hard work. But Jesus is lifting up Mary's stance, a stance that puts herself not above Jesus, but at Jesus' feet. Ed Yost understood that the church was not about Ed Yost, that it was about Jesus. And it's not as easy as it sounds, believe me. <laughs> because... Pastors have egos, (laughs) and pastors want successful churches. And when they are, you know, you can start to let it go to your head. We have egos just like Martha, but what I appreciated about Pastor Yos is his wisdom of understanding, okay, my work here is done, I have built this church, or (laughs) there I go, Jesus has built this church up, And now it's time to hand it over to someone else. And with that, Pastor Yost ended up at St. James Lutheran Church in Baltimore, Maryland. 
it stood in stark contrast to Holy Trinity. It was a well-established congregation. It was a struggling congregation as opposed to the thriving congregation of Holy Trinity. It was in the city, not in the suburbs, and it found itself in a changing neighborhood, a struggling neighborhood with the very familiar story of a neighborhood of white flight and, and really turning, turning black. And with that, Pastor Yost, who enjoyed popularity at Holy Trinity, all of a sudden was facing some opposition because he was seeking to integrate the congregation to reflect the community. And the challenge at St. James was not just about race. It really was about change. And it was about the attitude of the people who saw St. James as my church. And so we are going to worship my way. And we are going to do things my way. We are going to do things the way we have always done them before. <coughs> and when you turn inward, when the church turns inward, all of a sudden you become worried and distracted by many things because then the church becomes about survival. What do we do to just keep our doors open, especially when the neighborhood is changing right before our eyes? Pastor Yost understood that he learned this lesson as a mission developer, that you have to engage the community. You can't be a church without engaging the community. And he, he had modest success, and I think it's why he landed in Sakasana <laughs> as opposed to staying in Baltimore. The congregation just didn't follow his lead. I just, for the, for, for the fun of it, went on the ELCA website to see if St. James was still in Baltimore. There's no ELCA congregation in Baltimore anymore. There is a Missouri Synod Church in Baltimore, St. James Lutheran Church. Maybe that's another sermon for, for, for another day, but uh, no ELCA St. James Lutheran Church in Baltimore. The Gospel begins this morning with Jesus and his disciples on the way. And that way, of course, is the way of the cross. The way of the cross is not the way of Martha, and it is not the way of Mary. The way of the cross is about Jesus. Jesus, who moves us forward in mission, into the community, and so, therefore, the church is never about the pastor. It is never about Pastor Yost. It is never about Pastor Peter. And it is never about the people who sit in the pews. The church is about Jesus. It is only about Jesus. And so that is where we start looking and seeing how Jesus has loved us so that we can go out into this crazy world and love as Jesus loves. Our life together is a life of being called, called in for the word and the sacrament, and then sent out, out those doors, into this crazy community and crazy world in which we live so that we can share the gospel. And in order to do that, we have to put ourselves in the proper position, at the feet of Jesus, listening to the gospel, being inspired to go out and share it.
feet of Jesus, we confess our faith through the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. God of mercy and healing, you hear the cries of those in need. Receive these petitions of your people that all who are troubled may know peace, comfort, and courage. Ever faithful God, reconcile us in your Son with the helpless and the needy, with those, who, with those we would ignore or oppress, and with those we have called enemies, that we may serve all people as your hands of love and sit at the feet of those who need our compassionate care. God of grace. God of the church, you gather us and send us. Help us understand backwards to live forwards. Equip, up, equip us with the tools of discipleship, being willing to listen and to serve, to act and to pray. God of grace. We pray for all who are traveling during these summer weeks that God will protect them, renew and restore them through this time away and strengthen their bonds with their loved ones. God of grace, through Christ you bring peace. Assure all who are worried and distracted by many things of your constant presence. Soothe those suffering in mind, body, or spirit. Sustain all who are afflicted with those who serve as caregivers. God of grace, we pray for peace that God will turn hearts from violence in our cities and families, open new opportunities for dialogue, and protect innocent people from attacks and errant gunfire. God of grace, we pray for all who are ill, that God's healing spirit will bring them through their illness and restore them to wholeness. We name this day Joseph, the Idlin and Tranosky families, Demi, Timothy, Josie, Susan, all on our prayer list, and those we name before you now. God of grace, in Christ you brought forth the firstborn from the dead. We give thanks for the saints you have gathered at your table. Gather us with them in your eternal glory. We name the saints of our lives. God of grace, life-giving God, heal our lives that we may acknowledge your wonderful deeds and offer you thanks from generation to generation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. We extend God's peace to one another. <coughs> Dave, God's peace. Tim, God's peace be with you. Carl Fried, God's peace. Paul, God's peace. Wendy, Ruth, Chris, Eric, Dennis, God's peace. Lauren, Hannah, Nancy, God's peace. <laughs>
this. God of abundance, you have set before us a plentiful harvest. As we feast on your goodness, strengthen us to labor in your field and equip us to bear fruit for the good of all. In the name of Jesus, the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Resounding praise belongs to you, Alpha and Omega, for yours is the beginning and the ending of all things. Through your word, you created the visible and the invisible, and in him all things hold together. By shaping a people bound in love, you fashioned a covenant that would never end. In the fullness of time, your word became flesh. You sent among us the firstborn of all creation, pleased to dwell in human form. Through him you have reconciled all things in heaven and earth, making peace through the blood of his cross. Before every beginning and beyond every ending, you call us to be your disciples and destine us to be your saints. And so we give you thanks in the company of angels and archangels as we join the everlasting hymn. Bethany to your son's feet, hungry for his word. So bring us to this table, hungry for Jesus. As your church remembers Christ's saving passion, come upon your church in the power of your Holy Spirit to dwell with us in the fullness of your presence and feed us till we want no more. Sanctify this cup that they may be for us the body and blood of your son who at supper with his disciples took bread, gave you thanks, broke the bread, and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, he gave you thanks. After supper, and took the cup, gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink in remembrance of me. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. God of Mary and Martha, your resurrected son has the words of eternal life. Give your church grace like Mary to linger where Jesus is. Grant us patience to abide among those who look to you in trust and hope and to stand with any who have no one to stand by their side. Where your children hunger and thirst for companionship, bring them new friends in Christ. Where they suffer from famine, be their bread of life. Open your heaven that the one who has reconciled all things in his death and resurrection 
may present us holy and blameless before you, and your word made flesh may welcome us to the banquet of the riches of your glory. In the power of your spirit, Holy Father, now and forever. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. In Christ's presence there is fullness of joy. Come now to the banquet. Amen. body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. Amen. Life-giving God, through this meal, you have bandaged our wounds and fed us with your mercy. Now send us forth to live for others, both friend and stranger, that all may come to know your love. This we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.
I have no announcements today. Are there any announcements from the congregation? If not, let us conclude with the benediction. The God of peace, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you, comfort you, and show you the path of life, this day and always. Amen. Thanks be to God. Mm -hmm.